I was wrong. Two weeks ago, after the race at Jeddah, I got up here with my sweatshirt. I said that these are going to be all the races that Max wins. Let it be known. Australia. He didn't. What a performance! What a comeback! A Ferrari 1-2! Headed by Carlos Sainz, who wins the Australian Grand Prix! Yes, we have it! P1, baby, P1! Immediately, when Verstappen's brakes blew up and all the drivers were passing him, my brother texted me and was like, you only had to wait three races. Yeah, that was crazy. It happened in lap two, which made the whole race basically exciting. But overall, this was a really odd weekend. With Alex Albin crashing his car in P2 early on and then getting Logan's car. Like, there was this funny moment. I saw it in a meme. I wonder if we have the full video somewhere where, like, it was Alex Albin's birthday and the announcer was like, what is his gift? And it was like... Logan Sargent's car. So Williams only went in with one car. And then Q3 got really exciting and Lewis missed out on it, got bumped by, uh, I think, Sunoda and Schroll. Then Perez got a grid penalty for impeding Hulkenberg. That was early in the weekend. And then the race started and Sainz was on fire, dude. So uh, not, not the way Verstappen was on fire, <laughs> but yeah, on fire racing. So immediately once Verstappen, you know, had to retire, Sainz took the lead and held onto it basically the whole race. And then I can't remember the exact lap, but Hamilton went out as well, making it, um, I think I saw scrolling through Instagram or something that this is the first time that both Verstappen and Hamilton retired with mechanical issues, which is just kind of funny. But I wonder what's going on with Hamilton overall, you know, like racing is obviously really dangerous. Mercedes car is not doing really well. So he's really not going to push it to the edge. I mean, I'm just speaking from my limited ex experience, some of the things I've heard, he's really not going to push it to the edge every race, you know, especially if he's not really fighting for that driver's championship. Mercedes not really fight. I mean, it's still early, but he's not, they're not really fighting for the constructor's championship. So it makes you wonder where his head's at, where the team is at with focus on him and his car. But yeah, if you guys know any better than me, please like, let's talk about it in the comments because I'd like to know more about the Hamilton situation because I do root for Hamilton and I'm excited to see him on Ferrari next year. And yeah, it's just an interesting situation, him with Mercedes. And I hope it's not too negative of a final year, but whatever, it is what it is. Everyone will be okay. With how well Signs is racing, it really makes the open seats that come up next year really interesting like I think there are so many seats so much is going to happen like really I think it's just Ferrari and McLaren that are locked down so it's really going to make it interesting and you know like Sainz can end up at Mercedes he could end up at Red Bull he could end up at Sauber uh, that will become Audi it's interesting so for a bit it was Sainz, Norris, Leclerc, Piastri and then for a good amount of the race it was Sainz P1, Leclerc P2, and then the McLarens. I think it was Piastri and Lando Norris. And then, like, I guess, like, almost all the way through the Leclerc's second stint, he was losing a bit of time. So McLaren took the gamble of swapping Norris and Piastri to have Norris catch Leclerc. There's the call. This is not going to be popular amongst the Aussies. But he's going to pull over, and Norris will sweep through for third. Piastri playing the team game. Norris is on tyres that are five laps younger than Oscar Piastri. And he didn't. I mean, I got worried a bit when Leclerc said he's, like, not really feeling the balance. But they held on. So Ferrari ended up winning. 1-2. Signs P1. Leclerc P2. And it was bittersweet because... Uh, I've been a Ferrari fan this year, but I was really looking forward to Leclerc winning. You know, I guess I'll have to wait to get to that. But no, it's crazy story from Signs. You know, just two weeks ago, literally being barely able to walk with the appendicitis and then now, you know, winning this race. He's really driving with something to prove and it really makes that that opens those open seats that much more exciting. And then Lando finished third and Piastri fourth. You know, at, at a couple points, I kind of thought Ferrari was going to get an opportunity to race each other. You know, even at McLaren as well. I don't think we ever got to that point in this race, but um, especially listening to the driver interviews at the end. Um, but that would have been exciting. And I wonder what would have went down. But, you know, like Leclerc mentioned, Sainz was just outracing him. He just 
was better this weekend, and it definitely showed, and he definitely deserved it. So with Verstappen and Hamilton out, it left two crucial places in the points for the lower five teams, and it looked like it was only it was going to be uh, Tsunoda in ninth and Hulkenberg in tenth, and I guess that would have put both RB and Haas tied for six with two points, and then basically on the last lap. Russell crashed in the Mercedes and then that opened up another point for Haas so it was Sonoda in eighth Hulkenberg in ninth Magnussen in tenth in the Haas so two points each for both of those teams and then that puts Haas in sixth with three points and then finishing 11th was Alexander Albon in the Williams that decision to give Albon the car instead of Sargent is definitely the right decision you know, it gives Williams the best chance to get the points, and especially this year where the top five teams are really dominating. Any point really matters for those teams. It just, so it's definitely like a brutal and tough decision to make from Williams. It just sucks. Like, what were they doing bringing one chassis per car? Like, they didn't have any extra. I Like, I'm still new to the game, learning about what how the F1 teams operate. There just seems like a lot of, dumb things happening with the lower five teams like only bringing one chassis per car for Williams um, and then the the mistakes in the pit lane for Sauber is like screwing them over like they, I think at one point those two Baltas and Zhao were like racing like 18 seconds behind everybody both in last place just like chilling and then following up on uh Tsunoda and Ricardo, man, it does really seem like Tsunoda is definitely out racing him, um, which is, you know, good. I like Yuki, but I also like Danny Rick. So uh, I wonder at what point those that seat comes in uh, jeopardy because the drivers in the RB cars are really fighting for the next Red Bull seat, and uh, doesn't really look like it's gonna be Danny Rick. Um, but what do I know? And that all depends if the seat is even up for grabs and. After a race like today, with Checo finishing fifth, I think. Yeah, Checo finished fifth. I kind of half expected him to really catch the McLarens and the Ferraris, um, but he didn't. So I wonder, like, if the Red Bulls just weren't on point this race, you know, if the gap between Max and Checo is really like that. I guess we'll see over the next couple months, like, where everything stands with Red Bull. Besides Ferrari winning... One of the highlights of the whole race was Gunther. It's not even in the race, but Gunther doing the post-race interviews. And it was a couple of funny moments between him and Charles where Charles didn't really understand what he was saying, but he was asking the right questions. Did you think that there was going to be a chance to attack signs? And uh, I liked Charles' honesty, but, um, but yeah, it's good seeing Gunther still on the grid. And yeah, like for everything that people say about Drive to Survive, the real positive of it, is that it really does get you to know all of the people in the sport. The sport is so much more exciting when you know the people. When they become more than just names, you kind of have a bit of an emotional connection to everybody. You follow their stories as they go through their careers. This show does have some, like Drive to Survive does have some cheap drama here and there, but for the most part, it's good and it's exciting and it, it builds up excitement for the sport. It's caused the sport to grow a ton and it really attaches you to these people. And yeah, I like it. So let me look up the standings and see where everybody stands now. I know it's uh, Verstappen still in first with 51 points. And then Charles Leclerc, I think, with 48. Let's see. Oh, 47. And then Checo, 46. Carlos Sainz, 40. Which, if he didn't miss Jetta, then he'd probably be in second or even first, depending on what position he came in. And then Piastri, Lando Norris, Alonso, Russell, Hamilton, Stroll. Yeah, so it's the top five teams are occupying the top ten spots. And then another Ferrari driver in 11th. So the top five teams are occupying the top 11 spots. And then the constructor standings. This is good. It's close. Red Bull 97, Ferrari 93, McLaren 55. And then look at that, Mercedes in fifth. That's rough. Aston Martin in fourth. The next race is in Japan, I guess two weeks from now, and we'll find out where Ferrari stands really with Red Bull because, like Sainz said, 
he was staying close after that first lap within DRS, and he might have been able to stick around Verstappen and make something happen in this race. So, But hopefully two weeks from now it's Leclerc doing that. Um, but, yeah, we'll see. And then one more note about the standings. Because I'm an American, we have one American driver, Logan Sargent, is currently 21st out of a 20-driver grid. So, dude, come on. <laughs> come on. Let's do something. Get some points here. Yeah, it's exciting. Uh, I love it. 